So welcome to the fourth in our series, Beyond Voting. I'm Jane O'Neill, the co-chair of the Social and Environmental Justice Team at BUC, along with my co-chair, Julia Pulver. And as always, I'm very grateful for the assistance of Mary Jo Ebert. And thank you to whoever turned off their metronome just now. <laughs> we okay. created... Hi, Alisa. Hi, Alisa. Thanks for being here. <laughs> We created this uh, webinar series because we all agree the 2020 election is possibly the most important election in our lives. And with all the many issues that need attention, underlying all of these is our democratic process. And there's really very little doubt that our form of government is under attack and needs protection, our democracy. And the only way that these changes will come is through the involvement of citizens. So tonight, we've invited Lisa Brown to talk to us about the election process and how it can be made better and what we can do to help. Lisa is the Oakland County Clerk and Register of Deeds and has been in that position, I believe, since 2012. Um, before that, she has previously been a member of the Michigan State House of Representatives and was a Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor in 2014. So Lisa will make her remarks and then take your questions. Please go ahead and put your questions in the chat box and then we can address those when the time comes. Take it away, Lisa. Okay, well, thank you so much. First of all, I, I want to applaud you uh, for having um, this four part series and educating the members of BUC and for those who are participating who, who want to know more and be more active. Um, takes every level of involvement to make things happen. And um, so thank you and thank you for, for the invitation for me to be a part of this. I'm, I'm truly honored. Um, and honestly, I look at all of you as ambassadors. So with the information that I will be sharing with you that you will then go on and share it with your larger networks because you know, we do see a lot of misinformation out there, whether it's intentional or not. And um, it can be very harmful. Um, in 2016, there was a mail piece, and I know, I know it was an accident, but there was a candidate who sent out a, a mail piece um, that said, don't forget to return, it wasn't me, but don't forget to return your absentee ballot to your county clerk. And in Michigan, your ballot does not go to the county clerk, as hopefully you all know that it goes to your city or township clerk, not your village clerk either, but your city or township clerk. So, um, you know, 46 other states, it's all done at the county level, but Michigan, we are decentralized. So there's a lot of disinformation that can really uh, confuse voters and disenfranchise voters. So uh, we wanna make sure that voters have the correct information. So again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to view you all as ambassadors. So thank you. Um, so the first thing, let's see, I know we had some on the flyer. If I can find the flyer, I wanted to go in order that was on the flyer uh, to try and keep order here. So how you can help. So different ways that you can be involved. Obviously, voting is, is you know, first and foremost. But what beyond that? And I know that's what this is entitled. So. Um, being a poll worker and and what does that mean and and let me first by saying you can work in a precinct you can also work and i'm going to use this one probably a few times so i'm going to tell you right now avcb and i apologize that's why i'm going to tell you what it is from the absentee voter counting board so almost all of our municipalities in oakland county we are our, our uh our local clerks count their absentee ballots separately from the ballots that are cast on election day in a precinct. We do still have a, a couple of uh, holdouts <laughs> of our local clerks who take their absentee ballots to the precincts and they feed them into the machines there, into the tabulators there, which, you know, mixed feelings because I think if, if somebody who doesn't know comes into a precinct and just sees one person feeding multiple ballots into a tabulator, they're gonna think there's fraud going on, like somebody stuffing a ballot box. Um, so, um, but there's only a couple of our clerks that, that, that do it that way. And that's not what they're, they're not stuffing the ballot box, they're just taking the, the ballots that were mailed in. Um, and, and instead of having a, a separate ABCB absentee voting county board, they, they tabulate them at the precinct. So working in the precinct, um, 
in my opinion, you need at least at a minimum of five workers per precinct. Um, I, I mean, more is more the better because there's all these different job duties that people can do. Uh, it is now the law that, uh, it, and I'll use another acronym, EPB, electronic poll book. So basically it's a laptop, but not just any old laptop. Um, that is now the law that those have to be used in a precinct. And many of our poll workers are um, very seasoned and um, you know it's been more uh, accessible for senior citizens to work in a poll uh, because you know they're retired and um, so but what we have found is now uh, uh, with technology moving forward and now the use of the the EPB the electronic poll book some seniors not all I don't want to uh, you know have trouble understanding the EP the electronic poll book and operating that so having younger people work there. Um, a lot of our clerks are excellent about recruiting high school and college students to work in their precincts and really giving that duty um, to them. Uh, but there's greeters, there's the person who pulls off the stub, um, you know, uh, off of your ballot. There's the person standing there. There should be somebody standing in between the tabulator and the door, the exit. So that if, when you feed your ballot in, uh, it kicks it back if, if you spoiled your ballot, if you did something incorrect, that it's not reading your ballot, you haven't left and now your ballot's just been spit out of the tabulator, that there's somebody there to stop you and go, whoa, whoa, go back. So there's a lot of different jobs um, in a precinct uh, for people to do. And then working in the uh, ABCD in the Absentee Voting Counting Board, um, the, that's the group of people who tabulate all of the ballots that have been mailed in, all of the absentee ballots. And um, there's a bill going through the legislature right now, uh, or it may have passed, I apologize. There's so many bills going on right now for uh, in regards to elections, but um, I think this one passed, that um, you can now work shifts um, after 8 p.m. for the, in the absentee counting board. So, so the thing that's been, I think, um, trying for people who work in the ABCBs is that you're sequestered uh, because you're seeing ballots, you're seeing perhaps, you know, how people are voting um, and, you know, none of that should be revealed until the polls are closed and all that. So, so that group of people has always, have always been sequestered, but because uh, we're getting more absentee ballots, it takes longer for those to be tabulated. We're not getting our results to the wee hours and those people are having to work a really long day. So uh, to be able to have people say, okay, at eight o'clock your shift is over, polls are closed and that's why 8 p.m., um, you know, another shift of people can come in. So that's, that's a positive, um, I think, move forward. Um, so working in your precinct. And by the way, you don't have to work, not only do you not have to work in the precinct you live in, you don't have, you can work in anywhere in your municipality, but you can work anywhere else. You, you don't have to, um, you're not restricted to being a poll worker where you live. And um, so you understand that every uh, precinct requires at least one Democratic worker and one Republican worker. So, you know, we have some communities in Oakland County that are heavily Republican, some that are heavily Democrat, and it's harder for them to find workers. Mm -hmm. So they can swap people and make sure that they have at least one par one worker from each party. And um, there's things that they have to sign off on as one Democrat, one Republican. If there is a voter who needs assistance uh, with completing their ballot, that one Democrat and one Republican are both to be there to help that um, voter. So there's no, nothing shady going on. <laughs> um, okay, so that's one way. Um, being involved in your party and being a poll watcher, as they're called, or a challenger, um, that's another way to be involved. And there's, there's many things um, at, in, in the political parties of being involved, being a precinct delegate, and people can still run for that as a write-in candidate. Um, that filing deadline as a write-in has not passed yet. But um, so poll challengers, um, in addition, we have at the county, so after an election, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but 
we have the Board of Canvassers. Um, that is a body made up of two Democrats and two Republicans that are um, chosen, elected uh, by the Board of Commissioners. And um, uh, uh, so they rotate their terms every two years, one Democrat Republican is up. And, they, and so that's another way of being involved is helping with the canvas, um, being on the board of canvassers, if that's something you'd be interested in, you know, applying for that with, with your party. Um, or when we do recounts, I'm sure you remember in 2016, we had a presidential recount. Um, we hired 150 people to help us with that. Um, so that's another thing that, that um, you know, we need people to, uh, at the county, we, help, we hire people to help us when we have recounts and things like that. So that's another way of being kind of involved in the democratic process. I think it's really cool because you do see how kind of behind the scenes and how it all works and seeing that um, it does work and that all of our processes are in place. So that, um, those are a few areas or a few ways that um, you can be involved uh, beyond just voting. Um, do you want me to pause now and see if there's any questions on that, or do you want me to keep going? It's up to you. Uh, the, to... There are a few questions in the chat. Okay. Um, oh, should I click on that to open it? Uh, I don't, you don't really need to. So okay. one question is about, uh, is it true that you only have to be 16 years old to work in the polls, and do they get paid for that work? Yeah, so that's all done at the local clerk level. Um, I can tell you that there is a, um, uh, a, a difference in pay scales between municipalities. Um, some municipalities uh, char are, char they ch pay you to attend a tr uh, training. Some don't, but they pay you more on election day. It's all, you know, per municipality, it's all different. Some pay like $25 for you. And you do have to be, by the way, you do have to be certified to work in the, in the poll. So you do have to go to a two hour training and get a little certificate. Um, depending upon the size of the municipality, um, in Michigan law, a municipality that has more than 10,000 people, the local clerk can do their own training. Uh, other than that, it's done at the county level. And um, we did a training um, just kind of generically for the public, for anybody who, uh, either wanted to be certified and then we shared their names with the, with the local clerks or who just wanted to learn more about the process and how things work. Um, we did that and I think that, that was last year and we're gonna do more of those this year, although probably virtually um, so that people, because I think a lot of people don't, I, I feel like it's kind of almost an insider game in some municipalities as to how you get to be a poll worker um, people don't know, you know, how that process works. So there is an application that you would fill out uh, with your local clerk, your city or township clerk. And again, you would have to be um, certified through that training first. And what would the minimum age be? I, I think you're right. I think it's 16 that they could work, but it's limited as to what duties they can have at that age. Okay. Um, now there's a question about absentee balloting and sending it in. Do you want to address that later? Yeah, that's going to be my, I think that's my next topic. <laughs> okay. Um, and then if I don't cover it in that, like, let's come back to that question. Okay. Yeah. Um, How yeah, about we take Charles's question, which is related to working in a precinct. Charles okay. is asking if you work all day in a different precinct, can you also cast your vote on the same day? Maybe you have, or do you have to absentee vote for yourself? Right, so actually when we had for reason only um, absentee voting, when you were limited as to why you could vote absentee, being outside of your precinct was one of the reasons. If you're working in a different precinct, you're not gonna have the time um, to go vote in your precinct. So I would suggest that you vote absentee if you do vote, or if you do work in a precinct that's not your own. Did I answer that question, Mark? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but yeah, so that was one of the, when we only had certain reasons, that was one of the reasons. And it was specifically for, uh, I, I don't know if it's specifically for, but it really, um, to me, spoke to workers who were, you know, uh, election workers who weren't working their own precinct. 
that wouldn't be fair. And you cannot, and I'll get into this later too, but um, obviously you have to vote in your precinct. You can't vote in a precinct that, that isn't your own. Um, and uh, the tabulator in your precinct will only take ballots for your precinct. So for instance, let's say you got, um, you received an absentee ballot in the mail and um, you, you, I don't know, forgot to mail it back or whatever. So, and you're working in a precinct that's not your own and you took it with you and you said, you know what, I'll just, I'll just vote it there. I'll just feed in the tabulator. I already filled it out. I'll just feed in the tabulator. It's not going to take it if you don't live in that precinct. So that's some of our security measures in place that the tabulator isn't going to take ballots um, from another precinct. Mm. So, um, and one other thing I wanted to add is um, the Board of Canvassers is, is uh, open to the public for anyone to come and observe. And it really is a neat process. I mean, I know I, I like this stuff. So and I'm guessing you all do because you're, you're here, right? But I, I just love it. And when I, um, I help with the canvas as well. And there's, there's like this feeling when everything balances and everything works out, like it's just a feeling that I get inside, like, yay, a little cheer. But um, I think it's just, I think it's a really neat process. And so um, it is open to the public for people to come and observe uh, the canvas at any time. After a big election, um, it takes us, like a November election, it definitely takes us the full two weeks. There is a time requirement when we have to be done by to certify. So I guess I should back up. The canvas is the process of, um, that it has to be done and before I can certify the election. So we go through every single precinct and there's different steps that we take um, to make sure the number of voters matches the number of ballots that were tabulated, all these sorts of things. So, um, so again, I, I think it's really neat. So I invite you all to come watch um, and you can see the process. It's really neat. So, um, all right. So I'll go moving on to sort of the next topic, so to speak, if that's yes. okay, great. So uh, absentee, bail, uh, absentee voting. And I know that's a really hot topic right now, not just because of the fabulous passage of uh, Proposal 18.3 and allowing everyone to, yes, clap, yay. <laughs> yes, I, it was um, long overdue, long overdue. Um, I will tell you that almost every, no, I think every clerk, every clerk that I know, whether Democrat, Republican, elected, appointed, supported no reason absentee voting. This was something that the clerks wanted for so long, um, you know, especially for our local clerks who would have somebody stand, you know, at their counter. And I know I saw it at my own local clerk's office once when I was there and somebody came in to say they wanted to vote absentee. And the question was, well, what's your reason? And like, you know, like you could just see like the blood rush from their face, like, you know, I'm going to be out of town, like, you know, and then it's a crime to lie. Like, it was just silly. It just, it's silly. So we're just all so happy. Um, important for people to act to the ballot. Um, voting is a right, and it should, there shouldn't be so many obstacles to it for, for our citizens. So, um, so with the passage of 18.3, obviously the interest in then, of course, COVID. And um, people wanting to be safe, but still casting their ballot. So we know that we've already seen a huge increase um, in absentee voting um, for the uh, places in Michigan that had a May election, 99% of those voters voted by mail. Amazing. Yeah, it, it was just incredible. So um, we did not end up having any elections in May. Uh, we were supposed to originally. And then um, we had some school districts that were going to have some proposals and just with everything going on, they said, you know what, we'll, we're, we're gonna wait till August. Um, um, but for the municipalities and counties that did, they, I mean, it was almost all by mail, so 99% of the voters. So I don't know that that's what will happen in August or November, but we, we, you know, we're all pretty confident that those numbers will be up. And we did see higher numbers in March as well. So, um, but one of the questions I get um, is, the permanent a, a, AV, sorry, absentee voter, the permanent list, right? The permanent AV list. And I think a lot of people um, are under the misconception that they think that if they sign up for that, they're gonna get a ballot mailed to them every election. And that's not what it is. Um, signing up to be on the permanent AV list means that you will get an application 
um, to, to apply for an absentee ballot um, for each election you want to do. So like, I think that's really, I, that's, I just hear that one a lot. That's one of those, I don't know, mis, like I said, misconceptions or something as to what people think the permanent list is, but it just means you'll get an application. And if you think about it, like, um, you know, my, my middle son just graduated from college. So, you know, sometimes he was in college, sometimes, you know, sometimes he was in the dorm, sometimes he was home. So to just have like one address to say, for every election, send me a ballot here, you know, that doesn't always work. And we have snowbirds and everything else. So, you know, sometimes you want it sent to a different address or sometimes, no, you want to go vote in your precinct. So, um, so you'll get an application if you're on the AD list. Um, so you need to, and to request an absentee ballot, you need to do that in writing and it should go to your city or township clerk. I will tell you, I get a lot of them emailed to me every day and every day I'm then looking up that voter in the qualified voter file to make sure that I send it to um, the right local clerk because some of our municipalities, you know, or they'll say, let's say uh, Bloomfield Township, but they're actually Bloomfield Hill, no, the city of Bloomfield Hills. So I have to look up to see which clerk they're supposed to actually go to. But people, um, and I know the Secretary of State's website was confusing and where you're supposed to send it to. So I'm not, I don't blame the voters. I told the Secretary of State's office many times, they need to correct that. But, um, so it needs to be in writing. And if, um, if you sent it in early enough, then the clerk should be mailing you the ballot 40 days before an election. Um, we, we, we at the county level are required by law to deliver um, the ballots to our, our local clerks 45 days before the election. Um, so there's a lot of timelines going on that we have to keep track of. Um, but one thing I want to make sure everybody remembers, this is a huge thing for August, is that you can only vote one party. So we get more spoiled ballots in August than any other election because people cross over. They'll vote, you know, it's, it's going to be in columns. So there's going to be a Democratic column, there's going to be a Republican column, and don't forget the nonpartisan. So that, that you also have to fill out, you should fill out. You don't have to if you don't want to, you vote whatever you want. But do not vote for Democrats and Republicans on your August ballot. Otherwise, the whole thing will be canceled out. And the only thing that will count on your ballot is in the nonpartisan section. So um, we see that so much. And then if you're voting by home or if you're going to the precinct, you want, might want to bring your own pen because again, people are concerned about um, germs. Um, it, blue or black ink pen only. Okay, no pencil. I, I've told our local clerks like uh, precincts should be a no pencil zone. Um, no red pen. It will not be picked up by the tabulator. You know, you're spending this time to research your candidates who you want to vote for, how you want to vote on a proposal. I want to make sure that your vote counts. So please just a blue or black ink pen only. And fill in that whole, fill in that box next to your choice. Um, we've seen ballots where people are circling the name of the candidate. That's not going to count. That's the, the tabulator's not picked that up. The tabulator looks at that box to see if there's a mark in there, okay? And it needs to be enough of a mark. Um, sometimes, you know, somebody might rest a pen. It's not going to, you know, you see a one word dot. That's not going to pick it up. But fill in that whole, um, that whole box. Not an X, not a check mark. I've seen it all. <laughs> I've seen it all. Um, so, and obviously that's true whether, whether uh, you're in person or absentee. Another important thing if you're voting absentee is to make sure you sign that outer envelope when you're returning your absentee ballot. You need to sign and date that, okay? If it's not signed, hopefully your local clerk is calling you and saying you're missing a signature, you know, you need to come in and sign it or you need to do something to remedy that. Um, one of the security measures that we do have in place in Michigan is that the local clerks are to check that signature and make sure it matches your signature and the qualified voter file so that we don't have fraud. Um, we, uh, I mean, you know, Michigan really runs elections differently than, like I said, 46 of the other states. Um, we have a lot of checks and balances in place that some other states, I think, don't have. So make sure you sign that outer envelope. 
I know when we were having a prep call about this, um, um, this webinar tonight, um, one of the questions was, well, what if somebody, um, you know, can somebody from a neighborhood go and collect everybody's uh, ballots and return them for them? And the answer is no, okay? That would be against the law. If you live with somebody or somebody from your immediate family, they can return your ballot for you, but that is it. Um, or only a clerk, you know, or an, an elected uh, election official can handle that ballot or, like I said, um, immediate family or someone who lives with you. Um, and, you know, I, I know another thing that people are talking about right now is the post office and how they are um, strained, I guess is the right word, or uh, burdened. And people are concerned about that, um, especially if there's gonna be a lot of people voting absentee in August and November. So um, I know, so I live in West Bloomfield. I know that we have a um, outdoor, it's outside drop box besides going into the clerk's office and, and giving it there that we have something that's cemented to the ground, it's locked, um, a drop box. And um, I'm actually encouraging local clerks to get more of those and maybe perhaps their municipality um, you know, putting them in different locations so that people have access to those uh, easily. And I, I don't know that ours is big enough in West Bloomfield right now to hold what will be coming. I mean, they're going to have to empty that often, I think. So um, I am I'm, I'm encouraging and hoping that some of our local clerks or all the local clerks get large, secure outdoor um, drop boxes so that um, it does ease off some of that burden on the post office and our postal workers and knowing that you have, you know, you've delivered it yourself. But following on that train, um, on the Secretary of State's website, once you have mailed your FST ballot, and you're one, if you did mail it, you wanna know, um, did it get there? Did they get there, right? Um, it's called the absentee ballot, uh, absentee ballot tracker on the Secretary of State's website on the uh, Michigan Voter Information Center. And I can give you that website if you want, it's kind of long, but I can, okay. So it's M M V as in vote, I C dot S O S dot state dot M I dot U S. And uh, again, that's the Michigan Voter Information Center. There's, a, there's things on, uh, but so, and we have a link on my site as well, on, on the Oakland County Clerk's website. We have a link to that um, so that you can track your absentee ballot. Um, I think that's a great tool for people to have because people wonder. Um, another thing with absentee ballots to keep in mind is make sure, if you are mailing it, make sure you put enough postage on there. Um, it usually requires more than just one stamp. So uh, I know a lot of our local clerks are really good about uh, putting information either on the envelope or you know an extra piece of paper saying this requires 68 cents or you know however much. So um, make sure that you you do have um, enough postage on there. But don't okay. I don't know how to explain this. Um, this is one of my big pet peeves. <laughs> um, on the front of an envelope, um, there are lines that come down. There are vertical lines. That tells the machine at the post office that that's the front of the uh, envelope. So to look at that address on the front, um, don't put stamps over those lines because it will confuse where your ballot's supposed to go. Now, we have changed the envelopes. They're color-coded to uh, alert the postal workers that this goes to a person, this goes to the local clerk's office, but just to, um, uh, I don't know, have another sense of security, I would say, you know, in confidence, make sure you don't, uh, you know, make your stamps go all the way across the top of the envelope and cover that up. Thank you, Julia. Julia is showing the envelope. Oh, thanks, Julia. Yeah. Is it blue or green? Got a blue stripe or a green stripe? These are blue. Okay. So, yeah, there's, there's different color coding. And I know the Secretary of State's office has been working with the post office um, to make sure they understand what those envelopes are, um, you know, what the colors mean. Um, in the past, um, I think it was in, it may have been in 18, 
uh, we were finding that in some of the municipalities, um, the post office kept returning the ballot to the voter as opposed to moving it on to the um, to the clerk's office. And again, it may have been it may it was one of the issues was the design of the envelope because you could see the voter's address on the, on the back side, um, but the clerk's address on the front mm -hmm. side. And again, so if you cover up that, it's it just confusing. Can I, so can I ask? Yeah. Sorry. One question. Well, two questions. One is. Um, um, what is the last day to request an absentee ballot? Okay. Uh, it, uh, by mail, fr the Friday before election by 4 p.m. Wow, that's not very long. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't do that because, <laughs> I mean, you know, this is what's in our law, uh, but, uh, you know, the turnaround time, um, yeah. 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 So I mean, but I, I typically drop mine off at the Dropbox in Bloomfield Township because I'm not, I don't want to worry this about it. This is to request an absentee ballot. That's what you asked, yeah. correct? So, it's yes. Right. But if I get it, that's why I don't want to worry about the mail. So if I got it that way, I'd be driving it over there. But not everyone can do that. Right. To return your ballot, it has to be in the clerk's possession by 8 p.m. on election day. Right. So Lisa, when you say that it, it has to be there the Friday before the election or by mail, it has to be in the city clerk's office? Your request, yeah. So um, okay. you can go in on the Saturday before the election. And by the way, one of the things, the new things, I think from 18.3, is that uh, local clerks have to be open at, um, at least eight hours, however they divide it up, but the weekend before the election. So Saturday, Sunday, if they want to do eight hours on Saturday, zero on Sunday, or four and four, whatever. But you could go in um, on Saturday in person and request an absentee ballot as well. Um, and then the other question is, and I I saw this same thing is I got the um, I got an absent an application by, that got mailed out to everybody, mm -hmm. um, and I presume because it was mailed out by the state, the envelope they gave me to mail it back in was blank, and I had to fill it out myself. So. Yeah. I knew where to mail it, but, and it's written on there, but um, I guess that was because it went out from the state and they don't know everybody's. Well, the other thing is you can, um, you could take a picture of it and email it to your local clerk. Mm. You can scan it in. I think that was information that was um, uh, provided in that mailing from the state was they said that you could also um, submit it electronically. Like I said, I get them emailed to me on which you can you can go online and request it online too can you yes. not yes. yes yes so one of the other questions is someone has a, a family member who moved during they requested it and has since moved they need to go in again and request it again yes from their new clerk if they, they would need to re-register to vote i mean and you can by the way do that online um you can change your address as long as you so yeah you can do that all online Okay. Um, if they changed their driver's license, it should have automatically been done. Um, that website I gave you, um, you can also go there to check um, your precinct location. You can view a sample ballot um, once you put in your address and everything. So it's, it's um, a very helpful uh, website. I put uh, a link to it in the chat box. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Is everybody going on it now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun to play with. And I, to me, there's just there's just a lot of different things that you can find in there. So, uh, but you can register now if you have a state ID, a driver's license, um, you can register to vote online, and which is huge. And um, it it meets the the requirements of your ID being checked because you have to have your driver's license and. In Michigan, our Secretary of State is also in charge of our DMV, you know, our elections as well as the DMV. And so, uh, because they already have that information, um, which I've been encouraging. So normally, I'm going to high schools and registering our seniors um, to vote. And of course, you know, COVID happens. So uh, I've been encouraging our, our students to register to vote online. Um, and if somebody moved, they can they can do that as well. They can change that address, and then yes, you you need to request if if it's into a different municipality, your request would not follow. 
They can register online. They can't vote online. Cannot vote online, no. Okay. No, that is another thing in Michigan that we have a paper ballot, uh, which I love. Um, it's a great, you know, to have that paper trail, especially for our recounts. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's another layer of security that we have. Um, a lot of states had gone to electronic voting um, and some of them, and they bought expensive equipment and now they're going back to paper ballots mm. uh, just for that sense of having that paper trail. So we have always had a paper ballot, I mean, as long as I've been alive anyways. And, uh, you know, I'm sure at some point we were voting with rocks or something, but <laughs> something. That's how voting started in Greece. But anyways, um, uh, uh, yeah, you, you cannot vote um, electronically. So but. there's another question about absentee balloting, as long as we're still on that. Yes. When are, right. when are the absentee ballots envelopes opened? And what's the schedule for counting the absentee ballots? So right now... Um, clerks cannot open the absence the envelopes until the polls open on election day at 7 a.m. Um, again, there's a, another bill uh, in the legislature that would allow the outer envelopes to be open before that, not for the ballots to be tabulated or anything else, but just for those envelopes to be um, open, just to start with the process. Uh, but that has not gone through the whole legislature yet. So not until 7 a.m. and those envelopes begin to be opened. Mm -hmm. um, and then what was the second part of the question? Sorry. What's the schedule for counting them? So they, they, can, they can count them the same day because they're, that's voting day, right? I mean, if they can't- That's when they're counted, yes. Oh, oh my gosh. And one of the things that I hear that drives me crazy is that people will say, oh, you only count absentee ballots if the race is closed. That could not be further from the truth. Every absentee ballot is counted, I mean, assuming that, you know, uh, it was set, the outer envelope was signed and everything was okay with it, yes. Every ballot is counted. It doesn't matter how close or how far away the race is, they are counted. And um, yes, they are counted on election day. They, that's when they're tabulated, that's when those envelopes are open. And quite honestly, that's often why um, we're waiting for like final results on election night is that they're still tabulating absentee ballots. Um, it's up to the local clerks as to when the ABCD, I feel like giving a, a quiz and saying, who remembers what that stands for? Um, Absentee Voting Counting Board. Uh, you know, some clerks will go, oh, you know, I don't think it's going to be a busy election. So I told them they can come in at one o'clock in the afternoon or, you know, something like that. They're like, you know, you might want to start first thing. Um, ballots do trickle in throughout the day and, um, we, I mean, I've gone and visited uh, ABCVs before and, you know, they've done everything. They're just sitting there, you know, where they're reading a book or they're knitting, I get it. They have to sit there until 8 p.m. Uh, but I, I rather them have that free time um, and be done rather than waiting till two o'clock in the morning. Um, we have, and, and the, as, as FC ballots come in, the local clerk's offices are, or should be, um, processing them as they come in. And, and let me explain what I mean. So they should be checking the signature um, and that it's dated as they come in and checking them in and um, putting all that information in. Um, we had a new clerk uh, in March who, um, wasn't staying on top of that. I don't know how else to word it. And um, we were uh, at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we said, what is going on? Like, why don't we have your MC ballots yet? And she finally confessed that she had just finished processing them and hadn't started tabulating them, which made me and my staff really interested. So, uh, <laughs> Um, so clerks are supposed to be processing them as they come in so that you do know that they received it when you go do that absentee ballot checker, um, um, tracker rather, um, you can see, yes, they got it. Um, so hopefully that won't happen again. Um, let me just double check my notes and make sure that I... We have another question here. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, this is Eugenia's question. 
She says, my sister just moved into assisted living, so she has a new address. She filled out her application for the absentee ballot a couple of months ago. Does she have to fill out a new one with her new address? Yeah, so especially if she's in a different municipality, like I said, she's going to have to re-register to vote um, because she's now at a new address. And I mean, if she has a uh, any kind of state ID and changed the address on that, that should have automatically updated her voter registration. But um, yeah, because otherwise the ballot would be sent to where she doesn't live anymore. So she needs to ask her new clerk, wherever she has moved to, uh, first register to vote there, and then, and you can do that all at the same time, register to vote and say, yes, I also want to receive an extra ballot. Eugenia, does that answer your question? We'll have to unmute her. Eugenia, if you can unmute yourself. You're on mute. I can only ask to unmute her. Oops. There you go. I figured that was the case, but um, I just I just got this from her today. So I want I thought I'd ask. Um, she can't do it online. Um, so okay. And and she can't physically go herself to the uh, clerks. Is that the clerk? Is that where we, I have to uh, re-register her at the clerk's office? Is that what you said? Yeah, city or town. So does she have a? She doesn't have a state ID. Uh, yes. yes, she does. So, so then she that can be done online. Yeah, she can't do that online. Okay. Can I do it for her? She's in assisted living, correct? Yes. Um, I, I want to say yes, but I want to make sure I'm giving you the right information. Um, you know what? I would call... I mean, because you can assist somebody like um, filling out their MST ballot, there's a place to sign. Um, if you, you know, if, if somebody assisted somebody um, in filling out their ballot, um, you know, if, if someone has a disability or something, um, you would need information from her state ID, I believe, to be able to do that because that's how they check to make sure, you know, it's the real person doing it. Um, so I don't know if you have that, you know, like a driver's license number or something to yeah, that. She doesn't have a driver's license, but she does have a ID. She right, but on, the state ID has that same sort of long number on there. So, okay. Um, okay. So Donna, Donna mentions that if you want to help someone who is in assisted living, you should probably have a power of attorney for that person as well. If you have a power of attorney for her, I don't know what, how that implies, how that affects this, but. Yeah. I, I do not, her son does, who lives up north, so. I don't think that's required though. Is no. that required, Lisa? No, 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 like I said, I mean, someone can assist somebody yeah. in, in uh, you know, with their FST ballot or something like that. So I don't, uh, but, you know, those. It's not required. I've helped people before. I just have to sign on the ballot that says I've assisted them. Right, on the, on the envelope. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, power of attorney is not needed for that, but. No. Um, you know, having online voter registration is new. So I, yes. I'm, I, I'm not confident, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna give you the wrong information. Was there more that you wanted to cover? Because we keep getting questions on the absentee ballot. <laughs> so, well, I was going to talk about security a little bit, but if it's on absentee, let's go for it. Um, so do you think that voter turnout will be lower in November due to COVID or higher due to absentee voting? Uh, well, first of all, November elections are usually our highest turnout. Um, Ogle County, I think we're higher than the average. Where you, I think about seventy-two percent, I want to say. 
Um, you know, that's going to be up to each individual voter. I think that people, in presidential elections, we always have, obviously, a higher turnout. My, I, I hope that um, people do not skip voting uh, because of COVID. They can vote by home, at home. They don't have to go to, uh, uh, you know, the precinct if they're not comfortable doing that. Um, I'm part, I, I signed on to the Vote Safe Michigan um, initiative or coalition um, to make sure that everybody has the right to vote in a uh, safe and healthy way. And um, so I, I hope that there, that voter turnout is not impacted by COVID. Um, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> um, <laughs> I encourage everybody to exercise their right to vote, but safely. Now, I mean, we just saw what happened in Georgia. We saw what happened in Wisconsin. Like that's an absolute nightmare to me. Um, we know in Wisconsin people got sick from voting in person uh, with those huge lines. I mean, people stood in that for hours. We saw Georgia people stood for hours. Um, I know that a lot of our local clerks are working on, on, on making sure that um, you know, there's PPE available. I know the Secretary of State has talked about providing PPE to uh, our local clerks and to their poll workers. Um, but again, everybody does have the right to vote absentee, to vote by mail. And so if there's a question in anybody's mind, I would strongly encourage them to uh, request an absentee ballot. So another question was about getting the ballot translated. Are you aware of organizations that are available to translate I know that there are organizations. I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, yeah, no. I have a comment on that, if I may. Oh, great. What, what I've seen as a poll worker is that a voter is allowed to bring someone in that will help them. Yeah. So we sometimes see uh, maybe an older parent with a, a child, you know, one of their children comes yeah. in with them and helps them. So that is permitted. Yes, absolutely. Yes, you can, um, when you vote in person, yes, you can have somebody uh, uh, come and help you as long as it's not um, your union steward or your employer. Um, so yes, a family member, absolutely perfect um, for that to, to help with someone. I mean, I know we have, um, we have printed ball some ballots in Braille uh, for, um, some of our municipalities, uh, but we're not required by law to print them in any other language. We don't have those percentages that, that meet that requirement, um, but I, I'm not sure about organizations um, off the top of my head. Um, so Jen Waylands, is that something that you had seen or that you had been aware of? No, what's, what's actually kind of funny, but maybe not, is that I actually meant to write the word transportation and it auto-corrected to translation. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, 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 oh trans something we didn't even need to talk about. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. But um, uh, my, my question was about uh, um, volunteer organizations that help people uh, with transportation get to the polls. So that was my question, if you knew of organizations like that and how you can get involved. Uh, no, in fact, so one unfortunate thing, I mean, we have a lot of unfortunate things in our, in our Michigan laws, but um, it does restrict, uh, people can't pay uh, other people to go and drive people to the polls. Um, obviously you can drive a family member and that sort of thing, um, but if you remember, and I think it was 18, I want to say Lyft in a lot of other states was doing, providing uh, transportation for, and they didn't do it in Michigan because of this little section in our law. Um, so it's, I so, think yeah, you can contact your legislator and ask them to introduce so, legislation to remove that. <laughs> so what is, what is yeah, it exactly sorry. that's not allowed? I'm trying to remember what I had heard. If you're not allowed to charge somebody because that's considered a poll tax or or the like Lyft and so on weren't, they were offering rides at no charge, right? And that was right. a problem. Right, which 
Right. And I think they were just trying to be careful. And I'm trying to read, I'm trying to find it. Um, I know I, I know I copied off that section of the law, so I'm going to try and find it in the meantime. But, um, but no, poll tax, it, it would be more like um, the influence. So poll tax was... Um, I think it was the poll to voting. And this is more about like the concern of being bribed to vote, so to speak. Does that make sense? Like an enticement? Yeah. I think the poll tax in the past historically has had to do with people paying money yes. to show that they had property in property. the, you know, um, it didn't have anything to do with being bribed or anything. It was just, that was a requirement for voting previous, a long time ago. Right. Um, Right, those are two separate things. That, right. That's what I'm saying. The, ri the rides aren't about poll tax. That's more right. in the concern of, of the bribery sort of thing or, you know, uh, well, actually, or something. Actually, I'm seeing on social media some, um, there's some chatter about the fact that even requiring a stamp to be put on an absentee ballot, some people consider a poll tax. Uh, you know, there are uh, other states that provide the postage that they have the the postage is already paid i wish we had that in michigan that's like on my wish list of things um especially like i said because i've seen stamps go across the whole thing and um or you know i don't want anybody being concerned that there's not enough postage that it's not going to make it to their clerk's office i mean with the clerks that i've talked to about it they don't tell anybody, but they say, no, we'll, we'll make up the difference. You know, we'll, we'll we pay for it if it gets here. But um, of course, now I'm, I know I made a copy of that statute because I knew that was going to be a question. And now I'm not finding that. But um, sorry, you use bring the hard questions, Lisa. <laughs> I was trying to be prepared because I knew that would be. <laughs> um, well, there was another question about um, a move to make voting day a national holiday. Yes. Oh, love that. Uh, <laughs> I have advocated for that. Um, I will say in Oakland County, the Board of Commissioners are... Um, um, Lisa, I just found something that might apply. Oh, okay. In 2019, some voting rights group was asking for a federal judge to overturn part of Michigan election law that yeah, makes it a lot. crime to hire transportation to take voters to the polls unless they are physically unable to walk. Right. So it's a crime to hire transportation. Yeah. So yes, there is a lawsuit about that right now. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you for finding that. Yes. So uh, uh, anyway, so Oakland County, the Board of Commissioners actually last year. Uh, made um, even year November election day a holiday. So uh, only my staff and my election staff and obviously uh, the sheriff's department will be working on election day in November. Um, to me, that meant there's a whole new pool of uh, computer savvy uh, individuals who can work in precincts. So um, we're actually, the first thing I said was, oh, let's do a training specifically for um, uh, Oakland County employees who want to um, be certified as, as poll workers. So we're gonna be doing that. So we're gonna have a training just for those folks um, beyond the other trainings. Like I have an employee who takes election, every election day off, not, not in elections in one of my other divisions and works in her precinct every election. Um, I, I, you know, some people who don't support the idea of making election day a national holiday, say, oh, people can, you know, vote by mail and they can, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having that as a holiday, as I said, um, because we need more poll workers. And, and if you don't, if you already have the day off, then you're free to go, you know, work in your poll or work in a Navy counting board. Um, I totally support having, and, and 
you know, for our schools. I know uh, a lot of our schools are used as polling locations. Um, I can say as a parent, um, you know, I don't want I don't want a bunch of people going into the school uh, when my kid is there. Um, you know, I mean, there's a safety issue to that, that a safety concern that people have. So, um, making in, for November elections, our schools were closed, but you know, we still had May elections, those sort of things. So, um, so to have the buildings available uh, where we can have our precincts, to have people available to work as poll workers and in Navy CB, um, everything. I uh, to have the time to be able to go and vote in person if you want. Everything. I totally. That takes us through all the questions we have at this point, Lisa. Did okay. you also want to talk about security? I'm going to talk about oh, that. well, there's one oh, more. Are poll workers paid or volunteers? They are paid. They are paid. And again, it varies by municipality. Um, that's up to you know each munis municipality as to what they pay. Um, some pay like $175 for the day. Um, I mean, I've heard of like 150 plus 25 for the training. It varies, but yes, it, it is paid. Um, so anyway, okay, so security. Uh, again, we hear about hacking, we hear you know, rumors of that or accusations of that, or that our process isn't secure. Um, um, we, again, we, we have so many steps and so many checks and balances in place in Michigan. Um, the first thing, uh, I don't know if it's right to call it the first thing, but I'll say, I'll call it the first thing, is a logistics and accuracy test. That is something that all of your local clerks do. They publish in your local newspaper when they're going to do that because anyone can go and watch. Um, we have, uh, it's called a test deck. And there are all these different rules um, to create a test deck. And what it is, is, um, it's a formula or it's a pattern of Filling out, so we have test ballots, that's, that's what they're used for, they're printing out, uh, to say, okay, we're gonna give this candidate one vote, we're gonna give this one two votes, we're gonna give this one three votes, we're gonna give this one four votes, and we're, you know, on a bunch of different ballots, and um, put them through the tabulator and make sure that those are the results that, are, that the tabulator then spits out, right? So um, we, uh, you overvote a ballot, we want to make sure that the um, tabulator, you know, reads that correctly. You undervote all these different things to make sure that. So basically, you're you're uh, setting what the results would be, right? By saying, I'm going to have, you know, this person's going to get one, this person's going to do, and let's make sure that's how it reads it. And, and so all those ballots are fed in, and then this tape um, is printed. And you can see the results to make sure that they match what it's supposed to. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, also, something that we call the zero tape. Uh, so, to make when when the polls are open, the zero tape is printed um, to say that no ballots have been counted so far in this race. That we're opening this machine up, and you know, the count is at zero. Um, Somebody might look at the tabulator and see on the screen that there's a number on there, and uh, I think it says lifetime. So, and there'll be a number there. Even if you're the first voter, there's gonna be a big number on there. That's just how many ballots have been tabulated uh, in the lifetime of that tabulator, not on that day. So there's two, there's two lines at the bottom of the tabulator. One will tell you ballots tabulated and that's for that election. The other one is lifetime, which is just you know, the lifetime of the tabulator. Um, our equipment does not touch the internet. Uh, so, you know, hard to hack when you're not connected to the internet. Um, after the election, I started talking about the canvas. So, um, again, this is a process where whew, we have a very long checklist um of uh, making sure so we look to see were there any spoiled ballots um does the number of ballots match the number of votes that were tabulated um we go through the poll book and make sure um oh gosh 
challenge uh, spoiled ballots, any challenged voters, um, any write-in votes, um, just a, a laundry list of things that we go through to make sure. And, um, and then we have to give that report to the state when we're all done with the canvas. And so right now, we're required by law to say, uh, you know, precinct one from municipality Smallville um, didn't balance when it came in. Uh, but we, and then, you know, then we have a column, yes or no, could we figure it out in the canvas? Yes, we figured it out in the canvas. Um, you know, they forgot to write spoiled ballot next to, you know, voter 27 or something like that. Um, if we couldn't balance it, like, uh, well, two ballots were stuck together or something like that, then all that information we're reporting to the state, but, um, um, or, yeah. And then, um, and then we are required by law, and it was also part of 18.3, uh, that audits are conducted. So um, that's even a bigger checklist of things that we do, and it, it gets um, really deep into the, into the weeds there. Uh, we do, um, we check the electronic poll book. We make sure there's, uh, uh, it's password protected that all of the information in there is in a privacy zone that requires a separate password, all those sorts of things. We do a hand count um, of all the ballots in that precinct for a race. So I mean, we are sitting there counting them all out and making sure that that matches what the results were on election day. Um, we're making sure that one Democrat and one Republican signed the things they were supposed to. We're making sure that the local clerks posted all the information in the newspapers that they were supposed to that their local election commission met and uh, to appoint um, poll workers and all that. Um, oh, also in the canvas, we go through the whole poll book, um, make sure that all of the poll workers signed that they took the oath. Um, I mean, there's just, there's all these different things that we're checking. So um, we have, I think that we have more steps than so many other states in what we do. And, and that may be because we're decentralized, uh, but we just do a lot of testing before an election and then all those checks after as well. And again, because we have those paper ballots, I will tell you the first election that we used um, the new equipment on, and, and that was, as, as county clerk, that was my responsibility to pick the vendor, to pick which equipment we were going with. And I chose a vendor that had not been in Michigan before, but um, I am part of a national organization uh, for election officials and um, had the opportunity to talk to other people. But we had vendor fairs and everything else. So I was a little nervous though to pick a vendor that um, hadn't been in Michigan before. And, um, but with our, so one of our first elections that we used the equipment on, we had a recount. We had a candidate who wanted a recount. And I held my breath <laughs> during the whole thing, um, just praying that and not a single vote changed. Not a single vote changed from what was recorded on election day. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'm just a, I'm a side relief, like, okay, it works, everything works. And um, one of the reasons that I did pick the equipment that I did and the vendor that I did is because of the security measures that they have in place. Um, some things that other vendors don't have. And um, that was one of the reasons I chose it. Another was that I thought it was the most ADA compliant um, equipment. Um, I, uh, well, I, I had LASIK now, but um, I was legally blind before. And so I, I, um, I tried all the voter assist terminals, we call them BATS. Um, that's the ADA compliant voting equipment. Um, I, I, you know, took off my glasses and didn't contact nothing. And I wanted to see, you know, listen with the headphones. How do they all work? Um, how did the controllers feel? Um, all those sorts of things. And then also um, that someone in a wheelchair with some with the other vendors, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't see um, the screen that's on top of the tablet. And I, I, I don't think that's okay. Um, on one of the equipment, it's, it's, it's flat and it's higher, it's higher than eye level if you're in a wheelchair. Um, so ours is lower. In fact, I had some local, local clerks say, it's too low. I'm like, not if you're in a wheelchair. You want to be able to, you know, you 
should have that right to be able to see it. And the security for the voter that when would they put their ballot in the tabulator, only our equipment, um, has that American flag come up on the screen and say, and that says your ballot has been tabulated. And I, and I like that reassurance to the voter. Um, if there's a jam, um, if your ballot gets jammed, a paper jam, you know how like in a printer sometimes, right? You get a ballot, your, your paper gets jammed up in a printer. Um, sometimes a ballot can get jammed up. And the, our equipment says, um, you know, ballot jam, but it was tabulated. And then it's a real easy thing for us to get in there. Or it jammed and it wasn't tabulated. So then the poll workers know, okay, let's take that ballot back out and run it through because it wasn't counted. The other equipment doesn't have um, that technology. Um, as I said before, putting a ballot, like I just was reading an article that, you know, this made up story of fraud, you know, fraud, that uh, someone could mail in a bunch of ballots, like print their own ballots and, and mail them in or something. And um, they wouldn't be taken by the tabulator. Like they're, if you look at a, um, if you look at your ballot, you'll see like there's lines on the sides. Um, there's all this coding and it won't even take, like even if we printed it, it's not gonna take it from a different precinct. So it's, it's not gonna take somebody else's ballot. Um, so there's just a lot of levels of security um, uh, within our system. And uh, I just want everybody to feel confident about that because we do have a lot of checks and balances. Are there any questions that come up? One, one thing I've been curious about, and we chatted about it a little bit, and I heard from um, other places about, I, I know that there are five states that they only have mail-in balloting, Washington State, <laughs> I can't remember what the all are, Hawaii, Washington, Colorado. Oregon, Hawaii. Colorado. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I got to go ahead. <laughs> Colorado has mail-in voting. And I was actually <clears throat> at a, <coughs> sorry. This is our, I think in my first term, um, I was invited to participate, <coughs> sorry, in a conference from the Bipartisan Poly Policy Conference. And it was how long, it really the focus was how long should somebody vote? How long should somebody have to wait to vote um, in a precinct? And I remember sitting next to somebody from Colorado and they talked about how they, uh, from Denver, where they started y'all, just mail and voting. I'm like, how does that work? Like, it was brand new. How does that work? Tell me all about it. Doesn't it cost you more money? And, <laughs> you know, I was fascinated by it. And I just figured it was so expensive and she said, it's actually been a cost savings because we don't have to hire the poll workers and all that sort of thing. So, um, and of course their turnout, you know, went way up. And that's, I mean, that's what we want. We want people to participate um, in, the, in the democracy. So, um, yes, there are places that are, you know, strictly by the climate for the most part, yes. In fact, when, <laughs> when this all was going on, or when COVID all started and everything, I emailed uh, the director of elections for Colorado, because as I said, I'm part of this national organization and I've, I've been at conferences and everything. So I emailed him and I said, how do you accommodate voters with disabilities if you're all vote by mail? You know, how does that work? So, because um, I wanted to get a feel for it, even though that's not part of like my job duty, um, I still wanted to, I still wanted to get an understanding. He's a great guy and he met me immediately and it was great. But it's just, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to see how other states do it. And again, <laughs> they're like Colorado, they are, it's all county level. So it's all central tabulation. Everything is done at the county office. I feel as though it's just a matter of time and that's where we'll be. That there'll be so many people that will choose to vote by mail that will be practically there. Well, and that's what happened in, in May, right? I mean, 99% of the people voted by mail, but I don't know that, I don't know. You know, it took uh, um, citizen initiative 
to pass 18.3, even though, you know, like I said, the clerks have been asking for, uh, you know, no reason to have voting for years. When I was in the legislature, I, you know, we voted on that out of committee and it never went anywhere. Um, some of those issues have been pushed for years and the legislature just would not, you know, enact them into law. Um, it took citizens initiative to make that all happen. For whatever reason, the legislature is so hesitant to move us forward um, in our election process. And, um, you know, I think if we were to become vote by mail, I think that again would have to be you know, citizens initiative, it wouldn't be through the legislature. They just, just don't want to do it. I, you know, I, you know, <laughs> it was frustrating when I was there. <laughs> Does voting by mail, uh, it, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but it doesn't benefit either party in particular, does it? No, I don't know why it would. Everybody's having the same access to the ballot, right? You have the right to vote whichever way you want. Um, I always thought it was great to be able to um, take the time to sit at your kitchen table or wherever you're comfortable in your home, pull out all the, pull out the legal women voters, uh, you know, voter guide, um, really understand the ballot questions because sometimes a ballot question, and again, that's not my, we don't write those. Uh, some of the times a yes is a no and a no means yes. And, you know, sometimes understanding those is really difficult. So to have the time to be able to sit and read and do your research, I, I think that's, I, I think that's a benefit that everybody, you know, should have and that we do have and, you know, exercise if you want to. The other, the other thing to mention is about, you, you talked about spoiling ballots. Uh, the first time I voted absentee, um, I think it was 2018, I voted and I turned it in at the clerk's office. And um, then I heard something later that I went, ooh, maybe I wish I voted a different way. And I decided not to turn it in three weeks early anymore. Um, but I know that you can, you can say, oops, can I have a new ballot? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah, I'm pulling out my time table here. Uh, yes, you can spoil your ballot. Um, uh, you may request the deadline to do that is Monday uh, at 4 p.m., the Monday before the election. So it used to be you could even spoil your ballot on election day. Not anymore. Um, so yes, if, you know, the October surprise or, right, I mean, that's whatever it is, something, yes, you hear that, um, you know, a candidate doesn't like puppies or, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, something has changed your mind, somebody's arrested, whatever, things happen in this world, um, uh, you can ask your, you can ask your local clerk, they tell them that you would like to soil your absentee ballot and you would like to be such an issue. Yeah. Absolutely. Which would add some time. I mean, that's not something you do. It'd be some time issues. I mean, by the time you tell them, they get you a new one and then you submit that one. Yeah, I mean, you can, again, you can, you can do that, uh, you know, you can go to the clerk's office and do that. You don't have to um, do that by mail. Um, uh. You know, you can walk in and say, and and I'll tell you the time, as much as I talk about um, you know, voting at your kitchen table, uh, I have actually only voted absentee once and I filled out my ballot at the clerk's office. Um, I, I, my, my middle son and I went and we did it and there was a separator between us. You know, they had a table with the cardboard separators and um, you know, I, I filled out my ballot there and then just turned it in right there and he, he did his. And, so he if want, I, he didn't want any help from me. <laughs> so if I make a mistake on my ballot, here's a question. If I spoil my ballot, if I do it wrong and it's not accepted, um, am I, are you obligated? Not you, but whoever's my clerk at my municipal level, are they obligated to let me know or will they let me know? No. So if you mean like if you returned um, your absentee ballot and you crossed over, if you, if you voted both parties, let's say in August, is that what, is that what you mean? Right. right. 
no, they, they don't want your ballot. They, remember, your ballot is secret, right? So it's been taken out of that envelope. If they do it the way they should, your ballot is separated from your envelope that has your signature on it. So once your ballot, there's no way to tie that ballot to you. So no, you would not be notified um, that you spoiled your ballot, that you crossed parties or something like that. If you spilled coffee on it, um, which we've seen all kinds of stuff, um, and, it, and the tabulator won't read it, they will duplicate that. So they will take your ballot, they'll see, and again, one Democrat and one Republican worker will sit together to duplicate that ballot, to say, okay, um, in the race for president, they voted for this person, and, you know, all the, the, mm -hmm. go through the whole thing and duplicate it. That is another thing, by the way, that we check um, during the audit. Were there duplicated ballots? Were they duplicated correctly? Um, um, if there's a tear, like sometimes, you know, um, when they open the envelope, they like, if they use a, like a letter opener, <laughs> they might cut, cut your ballot. So again, that's another time when they would duplicate that. Um, but no, if you, if, like, for, like I said, if you cross party, they don't know it's your ballot, so they would not be able to notify mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I think a good rule of thumb that I would offer to people in our audience today is whether you're voting with a mail-in ballot, so you're filling it out at home, or if you're at the polling place and you're voting and anything happens that you think, oh, this isn't, this isn't what I wanted, and you're not sure whether you can change it or what you can do to change it, always ask. Call your city clerk's office and ask if you have any question at all about how to handle a particular situation with your ballot. And in the precinct, just walk back to where the workers are and explain the situation and they will, they will help you through. The workers there all really want people to be able to vote successfully. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, oh, also, if you're at home and you, you make a mistake, that's another time where you could um, request uh, uh, you know, to spoil that ballot and have another ballot sent to you. Do not use whiteout. That's not good for the machines. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, and don't make an X and say, and make an arrow. I mean, we've seen all this stuff. Like, X is not this one, this one, you know, with arrows. Don't do that. Just say, you know what, I spilled my ballot. And so what they will do, because your ballot does have a number, they will go into their system and spoil. If you got ballot 101 and you say, you know what, I need to spoil it. I, I voted it wrong. I, you know, whatever the case may be spilled coffee over whatever it is they they will put it in their system to not tabulate you know that spoil that ballot and then reissue another one so you won't be able to return the vote you're not going to get two votes out of it because they've already spoiled them in their in their program. Yeah. so the key but point cannot tell you how to vote but yes i mean you know who to vote for. the key and point to not tell you writing candidates it's, it's your municipality, and if you have an issue, call them. Yeah. That's, you know. Yeah, so do we have any other questions from anyone in our audience? We can unmute you, and you can, um, you can ask, or if you want to type a question, any last questions you want to type in the chat box. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think we have any more questions, Jane. Anne's and waving your hand. Oh, ah, okay. Yes. Um, did we discuss COVID ID, COVID-19, and its effect on going to the polls? Uh, well, a, a little bit in that, I mean, every, so the Secretary of State or your local clerk is sending um, everybody an application for an absentee ballot. Um, you don't have to vote absentee if you want to, but of course people are encouraged to stay safe um, and be healthy and to you know, have a ballot mailed to you. Um, and local clerks are, uh, uh, well, the Secretary of State is um, looking to provide precincts with PPE, with protective equipment. Uh, and um, I mean, I know people have been talking about one-time use pens and, that sort of thing. I, I honestly, if I was going to go vote in the precinct, I'd bring my own pen. I do anyways. I just like to make my own pens right. Um, just make sure it's black or blue ink. Um, but 
but you know we're, we're not canceling any elections right we're not uh we do have the ability because i think the passage of proposal 183 uh was such a blessing for us that um anyone can vote because of that anyone can vote by mail if they want to so um that's you know i i don't know if that what specifically you were looking for in regards to COVID 19. well i just wondered if people had to um maintain a distance and if you um disinfected the the voting booth and so on yeah, I mean that that so that's up to the local clerks, but they are, I know that they are looking into that. I know one of them was talking about buying sneeze guards. Um, it's uh, distancing the voting booths, yeah, six feet apart. Um, you know, all those sorts of issues um, that, I, I, quite frankly, I think will be an issue in the precincts. Um, you know, having enough voting booths so people aren't waiting in long lines because. Um, it's hard enough to find a space big enough to hold all those voting booths. Um, school gyms, right, are usually, uh, high school gyms are, are a popular place. Uh, churches are a popular place, but, um, you know, having that the normal number that they have usually of how many voting booths, and by the way, there's formulas of um, how to figure that out, how many voting booths you should have, in your precinct, depending on how many voters you have, like there's 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 a formula for that. But, um, but then being able to you know space those out and yes, make sure that they're being cleaned after with a you know, disinfected after whatever. That's um, that's going to be an extra burden on the local clerks and the poll workers. So again, I mean, I would encourage people, um, you know, if you're comfortable with voting by mail, to vote by mail. Okay, thank you. One more question here, Lisa. If I request an absentee ballot and receive it, can I change my mind and still vote in person? Yeah, you need to bring it with you. So did you, oh, well, okay, did you return it? <laughs> if you mailed it back and you decide on election day, I want to vote in person, no. If you, if you still have it in your hand, are they? It, it looks like they, um, whoever is on an iPhone, if you want to unmute yourself, the person asking this question. Hi, yeah, it's me, Marie. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I just wondered if I voted, if I want to vote absentee and I get the ballot and then I change my mind, I haven't even filled it out yet. Um, can I, can I still, I'm sorry, there, I'm in, I'm in, the, can I change my mind and just go to the poll? Yeah, take the take the um, ballot with you, um, so that you are surrendering there, surrendering it at the precinct. Okay. Right? Okay. Got so it. it and saying, I don't want to vote this one. I want to vote in person. Yes. But if you've already returned it, then no. Oh well, no. I, I, yeah. That's like voting twice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's how well, good the, that's how good the checks and balances are. If you come in to vote in person, we would be able to see Marie that you had received an absentee ballot. Um, this I've seen this happen. The person has an absentee ballot. They get they're sent home to get it. Oh they my god! To, okay. They have to turn it in. Yeah, they're sent yeah. home to get it and bring it in. Unless there there are some um, exceptions to that that I won't go into. But um, we'll like they know when you come in that you received that ballot. Um, so there's the checks and balances are so strong to make sure that there's no way someone is submitting two yeah, ballots. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No fake voting. Yeah, there's no... No double dipping. Yeah. <laughs> so we've had Lisa for an hour and a half now. Any other questions? Doesn't seem like it. Thank you, Lisa. We so appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you all for being ambassadors, right? You're all going to be ambassadors. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Share the information. Um, remind people, uh, black or blue pen, don't cross parties in August. We want everybody's vote to count. Don't forget the nonpartisan section of your ballot as well. Um, there's going to be a front and back, so make sure you check that. Um, and be safe.